Hi, everybody, and welcome to the final day to the talk session immediately after lunch. So if you don't fall asleep, I won't fall asleep. Um, so anyway, my name is Paul Moore. I maintain the SC Linux subsystem in the kernel, as well as the audit and labeled networking subsystems. Um, I also do libseccomp, which I think we heard mentioned once or twice. So um, if you're interested in any of those things beyond the talk today, you can find me in the hallways or whatnot. I'm more than happy to talk with you about it. But anyway, we got 30 minutes to <laughs> explain everything you ever wanted to know about SC Linux and all the stuff we've done over the past year and all the things we're going to do over the previous or the upcoming year. 30 minutes, so we'll get started. So what is SC Linux? SC Linux is flexible, mandatory access control. Um, and I'm sure that means pretty much nothing to most of you. But um, we really want to drive home the flexible aspect part of this. That's, that's kind of the, the key notion that you see pop up a lot when we talk about SC Linux. And that's really kind of driven the design and the development of it over the years. And that really starts with the policy language itself. Um, that's you know kind of the key important part of SC Linux that a lot of people deal with. That's kind of one of the main touch points of SC Linux. And part of having a flexible policy language is basically first separating that from the enforcement mechanism. Um, this allows you first and foremost to have multiple different policies available. And you see this on things like Fedora and other Linux distributions that support SC Linux. You know, Fedora ships with a a targeted by default, but we also offer a strict and MLS policies. I think there's also a base policy now. But the point is, you can, you can pick and choose from some predefined SC Linux policies to suit whatever you're trying to do. Um, and there's also Android. I think everyone at this point knows that all recent versions of Android from the past few years use SC Linux to help enforce their security policy. And that, once again, has an entirely separate security policy from what you'll find on Fedora or any other mainstream Linux distributions. So that's kind of an important key thing to remember about SE Linux is that, you know, if you don't like the SE Linux policy that you have, you can go ahead and create your own. There's nothing stopping you. All the tools are freely available. There's been, you know, more documentation written about SE Linux than I can even begin to repeat in half an hour. So there's plenty of resources. The other part about the policy is we have very granular access controls. Um, this allows you to really craft policy that is only going to permit you know, the very bare minimum of privilege um, that you need for the application to do its job. Um, you know, there's lots of discussion that goes back and forth as to you know, what level of granularity is the right level of granularity. But with SE Linux, we take the approach of trying to give you as fine-grained granularity as we can within the kernel. And then we allow you, as the policy writer, to go ahead and you, know, you can abstract that out with how you write the policy. You know, if you, if you want to go with a simple read, write, execute, append, you can do that with SE Linux policy. But we also allow you to go much finer-grained if you want. And finally, we have labels, you know, rather famously. I think that's one of the big things when people first approach SC Linux that they kind of have to wrap their head around is we're a label-based security mechanism. And we do this for good reason. I, you know, it's not because we like antagonizing people um, and our user base. We kind of do maybe a little bit from time to time. But in general, we do try to make this easy on people. And the point of labels is it abstracts away a lot of the details about the objects. You know, you don't have to necessarily worry about, you know, what's the path name for a file because I think as we know and as containers have made, you know, very significant in the past few years, you can have multiple path names to the same chunk of data on disk. And so by kind of abstracting that and using labels instead, you don't have to worry about the object specifics and you can instead focus on the security properties of the data, the objects on the system. So that's kind of it. That's all I'm going to say about the policy, um, other than, I guess, a little lie. The other important part, and this is where the mandatory access control comes in, is that the policy is controlled by the system administrator. Now, you can write policy to allow individual users to you know, modify certain aspects or certain attributes of the policy. But in general, that's a right that the administrator you know, gives up to the individual users. By default, it's the administrator that controls the security policy, not the object creator. And what I mean by that is, you know, on a traditional Linux system, if you create a file in your home directory, you can go ahead and set the mode bits on that, right? You can do chmod, whatever you want. 
and on a discretionary system, those mode bits, that's your security policy for that object. And an SE Linux system, you can do that. You know, SE Linux doesn't replace discretionary access controls, but the, just, the mandatory access controls of SE Linux are going to step in. You know, the discretionary controls might allow you access to the file, but the mandatory access controls, the SE Linux policy, is still going to intervene um, if you're doing something that it doesn't want to allow, according to the policy. So um, that's the mandatory aspect, of mandatory access control. And I think that's probably about it. But before I move on, I will kind of try and do some questions as we go, because there's a lot to digest. Does this make sense to everybody? Is everybody kind of? I'm seeing a few nods, so OK, that's good. So here's something. Um, normally, I'd have more than 30 minutes, and I could go into some of the more esoteric details about it, but we don't really have the time. So I'm going to take a different approach today and kind of explain, here's what an SE Linux system looks like. Here's some of the things that happen when you install Fedora on your laptop or some other Linux distribution that supports SE Linux. Here's what's going on under the hood. So when you first boot the system, you know, you start up in init, which is probably system D for everything nowadays. But regardless of what are, whatever your init subsystem is, the first thing it's going to do as soon as it can is it's going to load the SE Linux policy. And this is important because without the policy loaded, you can't really enforce anything because you don't know what your policy is. You don't know what it is you need to enforce. So as soon as you get enough of a system up and running, you want to load that policy. And then the other thing that's kind of interesting in the init process when you're coming up and boot is you mount all your file systems, right? I mean, this is not new. We all know this. Um, but much as like you need to be careful when you mount a file system so you mount it in the right place in your directory tree, for example, you know, you don't want to mount user under slash temp. That's just not going to get you anywhere. You need to be careful that you mount the file system with the appropriate labels because of what we were talking about last slide about SE Linux is very label-based policy. If you mount something with the wrong label, you might not necessarily get the right access that you were expecting from your security policy. And for the most part, that just works. You know, if we're talking ext-based file systems or any other file systems that support extended attributes, it's not a problem because we store the SE Linux labels in the extended attributes. So as long as you've got a functioning SE Linux system, you're fine, you mount the file system, you don't need any additional options, you're off and running. But there are some file systems, as we all know, that don't support extended attributes. Um, you know, USB FAT file systems, uh, SIFS network file systems, um, we could go on. So in that case, we have mount options, which allow you to specify a label for that entire file system. Um, so, Depending on how your individual policy is set up, um, if you don't like the default label that we're going to assign to your USB flash drive that you plug in, you just need to make sure that if you're doing this at boot that you, know, you set up your FS tab so that it has the appropriate option so that it gets mounted correctly. But in the most cases with um, you know, any distribution that's set up for you know, interactive use, you know, like a workstation, laptop sort of use, um, they're going to have some defaults in place that work for you just fine. But just wanted to mention that up front because that's an important part. And then once you get everything mounted, you've got your SC Linux policy loaded, you're off and running. Um, it's, it's rather uninteresting. It's pretty straightforward at this point. Um, the kernel does all the enforcement. Um, you know, we heard, I believe it was James yesterday talking about, you know, uh, the inevitability of failure and, you know, not relying on applications to enforce your security policy. James is looking at me like I'm crazy, so it was probably somebody else. My apologies. Oh, it was James. Okay. All right. Haven't gone completely crazy. But um, anyway, so the kernel handles all of our enforcement of the security policy. It also handles the management of the SC Linux labels. So this is, you know, when you read a file off of disk, um, the kernel will go out and it, you know, it'll look at the extended attributes and say, okay, hey, here's my SE Linux label that I'm going to associate with this file. Or if it's like we talked about where you specify with the mount option, it's going to say, okay, I'm going to grab this from the, from the mount options off the super block and, you know, use that for all the disk um, accesses, all the files that come off that disk. It's also going to handle any transient objects, you know, so think of all the various IPC mechanisms, network sockets. Uh, pseudo file systems, you name it. And 
processes too. I mean, processes aren't an object, but they're very transient by nature, and the kernel will also manage labeling for those. So that's pretty much it. Um, the last bullet point is management. Um, as anybody who's maintained a system for more than a week knows, there's security updates, there's patches, things you need to apply. Um, SE Linux policy gets patched just like anything else. Um, so, you know, keep your SE Linux policy up to date, um, as long as it's your kernel and the user space. And we also have a number of SE Linux tools which allow you to manage the policy. Um, I think we mentioned Booleans during one of the Q&A sessions. Um, that's an important part of customizing the SE Linux policy. There's some great man pages on those, um, which will explain what they do. That's really kind of pretty cool. They're generated automatically. Um, yeah, so that's a great way to customize the SE Linux policy for your individual use case without actually having to go out and write SE Linux policy yourself. But you can always do that, as we talked about earlier. You can write an entire SE Linux policy from scratch. You can write individual modules. And there's even some cool stuff that we've done in the past few years where we have a prioritized module store. So you can do something neat of, you know, creating your own policy for Apache. And whenever your distribution ships an update to the Apache policy module, it won't blow away your changes. Um, that was really annoying for a long time. Um, but anyway, once again, we don't have time to go into all this stuff. But if this sounds interesting to you, find me afterwards, and I can give you some pointers. So what does the enforcement actually look like, right? So we, we've done all this work, but what actually happens in the kernel whenever you, uh, you do an access request? So whenever kernel sees an access request, you know, we always talk about subjects and objects and the access. So the subjects, it's pretty simple. It's a process, right? It's a user a process. It's something on the system that is trying to do something to something else. Is that clear? Right? It's a lot of somethings in there. But so in this particular case, I always like to use Apache as my example. So um, in this case, the web, web server Apache, that's going to be your subject. And the files on disk that it's trying to serve up, that's going to be your object. And in this particular example, the access is read, right? We're just Apache is trying to read an HTML file so it can serve it up to a client. It's pretty simple. And on that third line, it's in blue, but I'm not sure how well that's coming across on the uh, presentation or on the video. Uh, but it's that last line. You see SE Linux has labeled the subject as httpd underscore t. The object is httpd sys content t. And the access, this is SE Linux policy, it's a file, and we're granting open and read access. So that httpd t has open and read access for files labeled HTTP sys context t. And that's SC Linux policy, I kid you not. Um, we would tack an allow on the front and a semicolon at the end and change the order of that a little bit, but that's SC Linux policy. So if you can understand these three things, that's all you need. Um, SC Linux is not necessarily a complicated thing. Now, it's one of those things, it's a simple concept that of course is repeated you know, hundreds and thousands of times, but at its core, this is SE Linux access control. So I guess I'll pause for a minute. Does anybody have any questions about this? Does this kind of make sense? All right, great. So here's my marketing plug for all of you. Here's why you should use SE Linux. So if you've got a system that supports SE Linux and you've got it turned off, Here's why you should turn it on. So back before virtualization and containers, the, the big sell for SE Linux was that it was a great way to restrict services on your system that were running in high-risk environments. So Apache is a great example, right? You've got a public network-facing daemon, which has you know a huge code base. You're running executables out of it, um, very high risk. You know, you're, you're potentially getting untrusted user input into it. So you want to try and contain that as much as you can. And that's what SE Linux does. And in fact, we, you know, I don't want to say this was great, but um, if you all remember Shellshock from several years ago now, I mean, it was, it was bad at the time, but considering events over the past year, it's kind of like, eh. Um, <laughs> But it was, it was pretty scary at the time. And SE Linux, this was a great use case of people that had SE Linux 
you know, running on their system and containing uh, the Apache daemon, you know, we mitigated the exploit. Sure, you could still exploit Apache and, you know, get your remote shell, but SC Linux confined the Apache daemon to only the accesses which you allowed in your SC Linux policy. So, sure, they had access to your server, but they couldn't really do anything. You know, they couldn't get access to Etsy password. They couldn't get access to Etsy shadow. Um, so that was, you know, that's kind of the big selling point. You know, SC Linux has value to you even if you're not running virtualization, even if you're not running containers. Although, show of hands, who's not running some form of virtualization or containers? Hey, two, three, all right, great. Um, so anyway, and of course, you know, you, you can't give a talk or have any sort of technology these days if you don't have some support for virtualization and containers, despite the fact that we have a whopping three people here that, you know, could care less. So anyway, the, the big thing about SE Linux is that, you know, much like we can contain, you know, individual uh, servers on the system, we want to be able to take that same principle and apply it to individual VMs and individual containers. And we can do that. And there's some really neat things that have, done, have been done called SVIRT that leverage some of the MCS capabilities, which I realize I'm just throwing names at you at this point, but you can always Google them afterwards. Um, but basically, this allows us to separate not only the guests and the containers from the host system, but also from each other. Um, so, you know, you, Coke can't steal Pepsi secrets and Pepsi can't steal Coke secrets and nobody can steal the host secrets. And, Everybody's happy in their own little silos. Um, however, as um, Casey alluded to beforehand, the tricky part about setting up these big silos is you still need to share in between. And SC Linux, thanks to that very granular access control policy, um, not going to say it's easy because controlled sharing is never easy. If anyone tells you that it is, they're lying. Um, but we provide lots of mechanisms and lots of avenues for you to do that. And we've got support for pretty much all the virtualization uh, mechanisms out there. Um, all the container ones, Dockers, Kubernetes, RunC, Cryo. I, I kind of lose track um, of all the container runtimes that support it. But it's out there. Most likely, you've, you've got support for it. Um, and also, we talked about this a little before, wide platform support, right? You see SC Linux on servers. You see it on laptops. Um, we already talked about Android. Um, you see it increasingly in all the various different network appliances that are popping up. So um, it's, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, thanks a lot to that flexibility that we talked about earlier. And last but not least, something that I think probably nobody in here cares about, uh, common criteria. MLS capabilities. Yeah, I, it's kind of cool. If you've never gone through a common criteria evaluation, I think everybody should go through it once and then walk away. Um, it's a very interesting experience. Um, but yeah, just, just do it once and be good with that. So, but anyway, yeah, uh, the, the reason I put this on the slide is that SC Linux has gone through multiple um, third party security evaluations over the years. So it, it's got a really good pedigree. It's been run through the ringer more times than I care to count. So, not too bad. We've got 10 minutes left, I think. So this is SC Linux in 2018. Um, but first off, before we talk about it, I just want to give you a quick little anniversary. So, kind of piggyback in what I said about common criteria, SC Linux is pretty mature. It's been around for a long time. Um, first release was back in 2000, so we're almost 18 years old. So I don't think, I think the drinking age here in Scotland's 18. So we're not quite there yet, but if you want to buy SC Linux a drink, I will gladly take it on behalf of the code base. Um, so anyway, but, and we've been in mainline for 15 years. Uh, it's been shipping as part of a, you know, an enterprise Linux distribution for 13 years. And it's been in Android for five. Um, and I think, you know, the general thing is roughly two billion devices at this point. And that's just for Android. That's not counting all the servers and the appliances and whatnot. So there's billions and billions served. So anyway, so now we're going to quickly go over some of the stuff that's happened over roughly the past year. So I, I think when I was taking this into account, it was maybe July of 2017 up to, I think, about August of... Uh, of 2018. So as far as the kernel goes, um, we added access controls for eBPF. 
So, you know, loading programs, maps, um, you know, using those, leveraging them. We have access controls for those. We've added proper SCTP access controls. For a long time, we had SCTP access controls just pretty much at the socket level. You know, can you create an SCTP socket, whatnot, you know, bind to it, read from, write it, from it. But over the past year, if you know anything about SCTP, it's a very complicated protocol. There's associations and there's multi-homing and a bunch of cool stuff. Um, but we actually added SC Linux hooks for all those SCTP specific niceties or functionality. So that was cool. That was a long time coming. Um, we also added SOPeersec to sockets that you get from socket pair. Um, so PeerSec, you probably not use, but you maybe have heard of Get PeerCon, which basically allows you to see what's on the other end of your socket connection, see what that SC Linux security domain is. So it's kind of a nice way of, of determining who you're talking to in a secure fashion, what their label is. Um, for a variety of legacy reasons that we can't touch upon in the next nine minutes, uh, we didn't have that on socket pair until very recently. We've got that now. And just within the past month, I mean, a couple weeks, really, um, we've moved to a new mailing list. So we're on vigor.kernel.org. There's the address. So we announce this everywhere we could think of, but I'm announcing it again here. So if, you're, if you want to be involved in SC Linux, make sure you subscribe to that list. And I just wanted to give a chance to say thank you to everybody. Um, unfortunately, I can't list everyone who contributed a patch over the past year, but um, these are the top 10 by lines change. So I was going to say, if you see your name on the list, go ahead and stand up. It's nobody, really. You're not just being shy, right? Okay, all right. Well, I was going to have everybody clap for you, but you're not here, so. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Thanks, guys. And you'll note, I, I myself added 27 lines. So, yeah, I was really proud of that. Very important 27 lines. Um, so, anyway, user space changes. Uh, you know, we talked about SCTP, so there was some, some user space changes to add support for SCTP objects in the policy tool chain. Uh, similar thing with InfiniBand, we added kernel support for InfiniBand last year, but there was a few things that were kind of trailing in user space, but we got that taken care of this year. Um, SE Manage is one of the SE Linux user space tools that allow you to manage the SE Linux policy, and we're not very creative with naming. Um, so that allows you now to list out all the potential home directory labels. Uh, we didn't have that before. Uh, SE Module, I alluded a little bit earlier that SE Linux policy ships in modules. It does. Um, SE module allows you to load and remove multiple modules at once. It used to be you had to do it you know, individually, which is fine. I mean, the, the policy is reloaded in an atomic fashion. Um, we, we link it all together in user space and then push it down into the kernel in one, one fell swoop. Um, that way we avoid any race conditions. Um, so the nice part about being able to specify multiple modules on the command line is now you don't have to do multiple reload operations in the kernel. You can batch all the changes up in one, link it all together, push it down. So it saves you a little bit of time. And did I mention we moved the SC Linux mailing list? Okay, in case I didn't, you know, that's, that's the new address. Um, we'll try this again. Anybody see their name? Wow, okay, I was hoping we'd have somebody. All right, well anyway, if you see these people or if you know these people, drop them an email, say thank you very much. Um, this is, you know, like so many open source efforts, it, you know, there's a whole team of people that are into this and, you know, some people are regular contributors, some people just contribute a few patches and we're, we're happy to have all the help we can. So if you're watching this on the video on YouTube, thank you guys. Um, and reference policy. This is kind of the flagship SE Linux policy. Um, we talked about earlier, you can have all sorts of policies, but the reference policy is the one that um, all others tend to be based upon. Fedora is heavily based off reference policy. I think Android's gone way off into the weeds on their own thing, but they have a reason for it. It's a, it's a different, you know, different, very specialized use case. So anyway, the reference policy's been around for ages. Um, a lot of people work on it. They've, I think there was two 
significant releases over the past year. Um, a lot of fixes, enablement of new software. Um, I had started to write these out onto the slide and the slide was getting ridiculously long and so I just kind of paired it off and we'll just say there's a couple of releases with a lot of good new stuff in it. Um, but most significantly, um, over the past year, they've moved off um, from where they were and now they're all hosted under the SC Linux project on GitHub. So we've got the user space development, the reference policy, our kernel test suite, there's a mirror of the kernel repository on GitHub there, so you can file issues and do all that stuff. Um, for just logistical reasons, the canonical SC Linux um, kernel tree lives on kernel.org. It's just the way it is, but the mirror on GitHub is maintained. Every time you do a push to the kernel org, it also gets sent off to GitHub. So, you know, you can base off GitHub if that's easier for you. And hey, did I mention new mailing list? But you'll notice this one is different. This is sclinux-ref policy at vigor.kernel.org. Um, we've always just had a separate mailing list for the reference policy. It's just the way it is. Um, sometimes you'll see stuff cross-posted um, because there's just overlap for a lot of things. But if you're just interested in policy development, go ahead and subscribe to ref policy. It's fairly low, um, fairly low traffic, uh, but you know, you'll see all the changes and discussions there. Uh, anybody? No? Okay. Well, same sort of thing. Um, now, these numbers are, <laughs> this number is a little bit skewed, so Chris, <laughs> yeah, when I, when, I, when I first did this, I, you know, I, there's a git dm, which will get you some statistics for a git tree, and uh, it's pretty cool. You can Google it. And uh, when I first ran this, I, you know, I just copy and paste it, and then I looked at it, and I'm like, whoa. Turns out what this was is um, part of when they moved to GitHub, we had uh, the reference policy was split into a submodule, a Git submodule, and the main Git repository. And this is one of those things that seemed like a really good idea at the time. But if anybody's used Git submodules, you kind of learn that it looks great on paper, but in practice, it's a royal pain. Well, I, the reference policy guys decided that, you know, it didn't look that good anymore, so they just kind of merged it all in, and that's why Chris's numbers get a little inflated. It's when he basically brought everything from the contrib submodule into the main repository. But that said, Chris does a ton of work on the reference policy. Um, the reference policy wouldn't be what it is without him, so. Um, but that's why he's at 96%. So last but not least, we've got two minutes left. Um, if you want to get involved, here's how to do it. Um, go ahead and take a picture of the slide. I'll leave it up there. And it's a little bit small, I do apologize. Um, but anyway, uh, first link is to the GitHub. I talked about it, that's, that's got everything. It's got the kernel mirror, it's got user space reference policy, our test suite. Um, that's a good place to start if you want to check this out later. Um, underneath it, that's the canonical kernel.org tree for the, uh, the SC Linux subsystem kernel. You can go there, but like I said, if you're more comfortable with GitHub, you can get it there too. Uh, these are the mailing lists in case you missed all my other comments that we've changed. That's where they're at. Um, you can also see the official archives. They're on lore.kernel.org, which is you know, a pretty new thing that's set up, but um, it's pretty nice. And we've had problems with other archive services over the years, so um, at least uh, the Linux Foundation people have set this up and promised that it will keep working. So last but not least, um, this is how you can get in touch with me, um, Twitter and, and email. Um, but I would really encourage you to you know, join the mailing list, participate there. Um, there's a lot of smart people that are involved in SC Linux development, all the different aspects. Um, they're going to provide you much better answers, much quicker than I will probably be able to. I'm just one person. There's a whole army of contributors. So um, with that, I guess I'll just open it up for questions for the last couple of minutes we have. Questions? All right. Yep. No. Oh. So just one, uh, where would I find the mailing list? <laughs> That's a good question, James. Thank you. I'm not sure if I mentioned it previously, but we've just recently moved mailing lists to Vigor, so you can find a link up there on the slide. Any other questions? Why hasn't the bot replied to my subscription request yet? Oh. 
you know, we had a little bit of a problem. They were asking for higher wages and more time off. You know, we just figured we could let them run 24 seven, not pay them. And they're kind of rebuking at that now. Yeah, I, um, the only thing I will say is I know there's been issues with the past on Vigor with various things. If you go to um, your web browser, if you just go to vigor.kernel.org, there's, there's some tools down at the bottom of the page, there's like an MX Verify tool and some other things um, that can help you maybe troubleshoot. There's usually some sort of DNS issue or some mailing thing. I, I don't own Vigor, so there's a limited number of things I can do. Um, I will say mailing lists in the open source world are a lot more difficult than you would think they would be. Um, for something so simple, they can be very complicated. Any other questions? Okay, so let's thank the speaker.